Well, if you have your Bibles, turn to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. Today I want to talk to you about supernatural living. And I want you to understand the title. I did not say I, I want to talk to you about living. We're all living. Okay, every one of us is breathing and, and walking around and living. But there is a spiritual realm that a lot of people do not get to. Okay, and I'm not saying they're not saved. I'm simply saying they are not, they do not have the disciplines in life to have that supernatural life. And we, even as Christians, uh, we tend to envy people that have these. Because you can tell when someone has that supernatural living about them. They're not perfect, okay? We are all sinners. But they are spirit-filled. They see the positive side of life. They don't doubt God. This whole world, folks, is, is, you know, you look on TV and it's just gloom and despair. It's negative thinking all the time. Well, I got news for you, folks. God is on the throne. God is in control. And God has a say about everything that happens in life. And I know God wants us to live supernaturally. But I want to give you a warning. It's not easy. It's not easy, folks. It is a challenge to your spiritual walk. If you have a bulletin and follow along with us, supernatural living, number one, the discipline of love. There's three disciplines you have to have in your life to have supernatural living. The discipline of love. Number two, the discipline of humility. And I am telling you, the world wants us to be full of pride. The world is so prideful. It's, it amazes me in athletics how everybody thinks they're number one. All right? And they're not, folks. God is number one. God is first in everything. Number three, the discipline of peace. And there are a lot of people that don't have the peace of God in their life. It's not just a salvation thing. You need to be saved to have the peace of God in your life. But there are also people that are saved but don't have the peace of God in their life. And I'm telling you, Paul in the book of Romans gives us insight to all three of these disciplines that we need in our life. You know, we do some things naturally. Uh, some people are just gifted in sports, singing, make good grades. I was always jealous of those that did not have to study for a test. They could just remember things that the teacher said, and, and so on and so on. But to be supernatural to anything is not an easy thing to do. It should be the goal of every Christian to live a supernatural life for our Lord and Savior. Three keys to living a supernatural life is obedience, discipline, and being filled with the Spirit. I'll say these three again. Obedience, discipline, and being filled with the Holy Spirit. Obedience is twofold. It's obeying God's Word, and it's obeying God Himself. Obeying God and obeying His Word is vitally important. Discipline in all areas of life, deals with saying no to temptation and yes to Jesus. Being spirit-filled is a daily process that involves prayer, meditation, and memorizing Scripture. Prayer, meditation. I think the biggest mistake we make in reading the Bible is we go too fast. We try to conquer a Scripture text instead of breaking down and understanding a Scripture text. Prayer, meditation, and memorizing Scripture. Our purpose in life should be to get our mind, soul, body, heart, and spirit surrendered to the Lordship of Christ. Paul gives great advice of how to live supernaturally as a Christian in an unchristian world. Romans 12, verse 9, the discipline of love. Let love be without hypocrisy. And folks, you know, we've said it over and over again. There's three kinds of love, okay? There's that worldly love, which is uh, a, a worldly passion. Eros uh, is the love that self-satisfaction, it is all about me. And that's what the lost person is, and that's the lost world. You see it on uh, television. You see it everywhere in advertisement. 
It's all about sex, 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 and that is the world's definition of love. The second love that we see in the Word of God is phileo. Phileo is friendship, and, uh, you know, friendship is good. Uh, You know, there are people that say, well, I don't have many friends. Well, folks, God allows us to have friends in church. That's why I love church. That's why when I miss, I miss the fellowship of my brothers and my sisters in Christ. So we have a, a, a worldly kind of love. We have a friendship kind of love. But the love that God has, for 1 John 4 tells us, God is love. It's very plain. God is love. And if we want to love, we need to know how God loves. And let me say this right off the bat, he loves unconditionally. See, man's love is conditional. I'll love you if you love me. I'll be nice to you if you be nice to me. I'll do what you want to do if, you, if, you'll let, if you'll do what I say. And it's that exchange, but it's all conditional. True love is unconditional love. God loves us in spite of our sin. God loves us in spite of our shortcomings. God loves us even when we're not lovable. We're not always lovable, folks. And God loves us anyway, and God's love is unconditional. Let love be without hypocrisy. Folks, we know what hypocrisy is. It's someone that says one thing and does another. It reminds me of a a play or a mask. Somebody puts on a mask for a play, and you really don't know who's behind that mask until the end. And even Christians sometimes wear masks, and they'll be nice to somebody, uh, you know, when they're around that person, but yet they can be ugly when that person is not around. And Paul is saying, do not let your love be hypocrisy and hypocritical. Look what it says. Abhor that is which is evil. Hate. What is the opposite of love? It is hate. Do you know we can hate some things? We can hate Satan. Man, I hate him. I hate what he does. I hate his influence. I hate the ads that are on TV. Being sick, you watch a little more TV than you normally do. And I'm just telling you, it got where I I look at some of the ads, and folks, there is an agenda to what these people are doing. There is an agenda. They are going against the very fabric of Christianity. They are trying to break down the, the family and God's plan for the family. So we can hate Satan. And we can hate evil. This is what it says. We as Christians do not need evil in our lives. We don't need to hang around evil people. It's kind of like hanging around a skunk. You hang around a skunk long enough, you are going to stink, folks. It's just going to happen. So it says, let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Cling is what? Oh, folks, hold God close. Man, don't let him go. Don't doubt. He loves you. He's your heavenly father. Do good, not because God told you to do good, but because you are a Christian and it is the right thing to do. Be kindly affectionate to one another in brotherly love. And Paul down through here in these next few verses gives eight examples of Christian love. Eight examples. Be kindly affectionate. Man, that's being nice. That's being sweet, folks. That's going the extra mile. That's genuinely caring about others in brotherly love, in honor. And do you honor your friends? Do you honor your family? Do you honor God? It is respect for others. Doesn't matter what they're wearing. Doesn't matter if they're tattooed or not tattooed or pierced or not pierced. Folks, God loves everyone, and we need God's love. Can you imagine what the world would be if it truly followed God's love? We wouldn't have these killings. We wouldn't have this hate that is going on. Giving preference to one another. What does that mean? I I said it earlier, folks. I love to hang around Christians. I love to hang around enthusiastic Christians. 
I love to hang around people that are just on fire for God and excited about God and that are pursuing God. It says, not lagging in diligence. Okay, what does it mean? Don't be lazy. Okay, your love can't be lazy, all right? We don't need to be lazy Christians. Fervent in spirit, that's enthusiasm. Serving the Lord. We serve a living God. And if we have that supernatural power of the Holy Spirit, we will find that joy in serving God, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, and given to hospitality. All these are characteristics of God's love. Folks, these things need to be evident in our lives as Christians. Luke 6, I just want to look at one verse there. Luke 6, verse 41. And you know what this is when you hear it. Luke 6, 41. And just as you want men to do to you, you also do to them likewise. I was raised on this. I was taught as a young man going to a Baptist church, it is the golden rule. See, the golden rule to those that are in the world is those with the gold rule, okay? But that's not God's rule, folks, okay? They're going to answer to God. I don't care how much money you have. You are going to stand before God. You're going to answer to him. But the golden rule is treat others the way you want to be treated. And sometimes, folks, we're hypocritical in that. We want others to treat us with respect, but we don't always treat others with respect. So it, sees here, it, it says here that the discipline is love is, our love should not be conditional. It should not be conditional. We need to love everyone. Why? Because Jesus loved everyone. Because God loves everyone. Then 1 Corinthians 13, I know you know this, but man, if you're like me, I need a review every now and then. Love, the love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4, the characteristic of love, love suffereth longs. There's that word patient again. Love is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. Love is not puffed up. Folks, that's proud. That's proud. Love does not behave rudely. Folks, we don't always have to say what's on our mind. We don't always have to say, I, I mean, especially when no, somebody doesn't ask you your opinion. Just keep it to yourself. Does not seek its own. Is not provoked. Thinks no evil. Love does not rejoice in iniquity, which is sin but rejoices in truth. What is truth? It is the Word of God. What is truth? The Bible tells us you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Folks, we need to love people the way God loves people. Now look at this last verse, last two. Bears all things. Folks, love can get you through even the most challenging times in life. True love, God's love, believes all things. They're not negative all the time. They have hope. They have faith. They have trust. Hopes all things and endures all things. And I love these three words. And I want to put one word in there. And I do not think I'll be violating the Scripture. God's love never fails. So folks, if you're going to have supernatural living in your life, if you're going to rise above the circumstances of life, if you're going to rise above the setbacks in life and those down times, uh, we can't always live on the mountaintops. There are valleys. You got to have a valley to have a mountain, folks. But being consistent and disciplined in his love is the way God does it. So we see the discipline of love. Number two, the discipline of humility. The discipline of humility. Look at verse 14. 
bless those who persecute you. Okay, now, folks, we're going to separate a bunch of folks right here. All right? Because here's what the world tells you. If someone hurts you, you have the right to hurt them. Is that what the Bible says? Hello? Okay. thought you all fell asleep on me. We, by human nature, want to get back at people that hurt us. And this really, the rest of this text is speaking to that. And do you know what it tells me? To use this much scripture in this manner, we've got a problem with this. And again, I'm not talking about being a doormat, okay, just letting people run you over, all right? That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about loving people who do not show love to, to you or is even trying to cause you harm. Can I remind you of a disciple that Jesus had? His name was Judas. He was going to sell him out for 30 pieces of silver. Jesus knew it the whole time, but Jesus kept ministering to him and ministering to him and ministered to him. The discipline of humility. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. And again, curse doesn't mean a curse word. Curse can mean you making this statement, I hope God gets at me. All right? Kind of like James and John got kicked out of town, and they just ba basically they're saying, man, God, rain thunder on that city. Just destroy that city right here. Okay? And folks, we're going to cover that in, in verse in the third part, so I, I, I'll, I'll leave that at that. But you, it's not talking about just cursing, okay? It's, it's having hate for that person. It's wanting to get even with that person. It's sneaking around and gossiping about that person. It's making people take sides over that person. Number, verse 15, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Now, it's easy to rejoice when people rejoice, right? No, it's not. Why? Well, and you can fill in the blank. I could drive me a new car if they got that job because, folks, sometimes prosperity challenges us more than not having things. Sometimes we are envious of people that God's hand seems to be on. And again, folks, I'm not talking about people being perfect. Nobody is perfect. But it's real easy uh, to, to see people that have things and be envious of that. And he is saying, uh, rejoice with those who rejoice. Man, if you get a new car, I'm excited about it. I'm excited for you. Maybe you'll come take me out to dinner in your new car, all right? You get a new motorcycle, man, come ride with us. We like the new ones too, you know. Rejoice with people that rejoice. Weep with people who weep. Folks, this is so important in life and in church life. There are a lot of people that have losses. There are a lot of people that have experienced death. There are a lot of people that have been laid off uh, through all that is going on. And folks, it's more than just saying, I'll pray for you. It's doing something for them, helping them, asking them what we can do for them. Verse 16, be of the same mind towards one another. And again, it's humility. You're not better than anyone else. Humility. I think the, the best example when Jesus uh, put on a towel and wash the disciples' feet. I mean, you talk about the King of kings and the Lord of lords washing dirty disciples' feet. And he was telling us we need to be servants to all. Do not set your mind on high things. See, we're a proud generation sometimes. We want our way a lot of the time. This is mine. Listen, folks, everything you have God has just loaned to you. I'm serious. My children were loaned to me. My grandchildren were loaned to me. My wife was loaned to me. The money that I have is just, it is because of God, folks. Don't set our minds on high things, 
but associate with the humble. With the humble. And we need to be and have uh, the discipline of humility in our lives. Do not be wise in your own opinion. And folks, everyone has an opinion. I understand that. And there are things that we're going to disagree on. Okay, the principles and the doctrines that we have, according to the Word of God, never change. And we need to stand by and stand on and defend the Word of God. But when it comes to the things that really, they're not that big a deal, does it really matter what color our, our hymn books are? I said in a business meeting as a 14-year-old teenager, in, one, in, in Lawton, Oklahoma, and sat there for 45 minutes because one group wanted a red hymnal, another a blue one, and another a white one. And I sat there thinking, why are we arguing over the color of hymnals? Folks, there are way more important things than that in life. And it's kind of like, uh, you know, when it comes to humility, humility is something that uh, is is just, it, it's not a high priority anymore in our world. See, we reward people that are at the top. By the way, for us to pay athletes $40 million a year is insane. That tells us what kind of country we are and what is important into our, in our country. And I'm not jealous about that. I'm really not. I thank God for my job. I thank God for my salary. I thank God for my house and everything. It's not a thing. Folks, money has ruined many people. And that's where humility comes in. If you got it, share it with others. Don't just hoard it. That's what humility is talking about. Let me ask you this. Do you think Jesus was humble? Do you think Jesus was humble? Sure he was. Sure he was. Hold your finger there and go to Matthew chapter 5. This thing on humility. Matthew chapter 5, verse 43. We're talking about love. We're talking about humility. And six times in the fifth chapter of Matthew, he says, it has been said, but I say to you, what is it has been said? The world tells you this is okay. But I'm telling you, this is not okay. Okay? Five, six times. There are six examples here in Matthew 5. You go and you read them slowly and you look it up, and it will go against what we call the American way. The American way. Verse 43, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor. Yeah, yeah, I love my neighbor. Hey, yeah, yeah, you know, we help each other out and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Whew, what do you say? Here's where humility comes in, folks. We can be proud. We can be arrogant. We can be full of pride. We can say, you know, there, I've heard a lot of statements is, they're just, it ain't going to happen. Let me just put it this way. I'm not loving them. I don't love them. I will never love them. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who despitefully use you and persecute you. Let me ask you, Luke 6, we don't have time to turn there, but in Luke chapter 6, Jesus makes this statement. This is Jesus' statement. If you remember, if someone strikes you on one side of the cheek, what are you supposed to do? Punch them back. What does the Bible say? Turn the other cheek. This is why, folks, I say this is supernatural living. It takes intestinal fortitude. It takes discipline. It takes self-control. It takes every bit of your being to do these things. Let me, let me tell you this, that Jesus has already done. Can I remind you of his trial? 
Can I remind you that they blindfolded him and punched him in the face and said, you tell me who hit you. What did he do? He turned the other cheek. Well, I'm I see these guys just boring up. I'm going to, I'm going. I even heard an evangelist say, he going to hit me once, he going to hit me twice, then I'm going to clean his plow. I heard an evangelist say that. I, even at that time, I'm thinking, a preacher going to clean somebody's plow? And we associate it with weakness and meekness. But, folks, I'm telling you, Jesus was anything but weak and meek. I mean, he was meek, but he wasn't weak is what I'm trying to say. This is hard stuff. That you may be sons of your Father in heaven. What does that mean? Folks, we're Christians. We're Christians. For he makes the sun rise on evil and on the good and send rain on the just and the unjust. It'll all work out, folks. It may look like they're getting the best of you, but we're not playing a game here. We're talking about life. We're talking about supernatural living. We're talking about not being like everybody else. We're talking about being like Jesus and turning the other cheek. And it says, for if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? There are a lot of people that can do that. There are a lot of people. And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than the others? Do not even the tax collectors do that? Look at verse 48. Therefore, you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Well, Brother Mike, I've been around you, and you ain't perfect. <laughs> you can ask Steve. We were out eating thirsty, and he said, I can tell you're back. <laughs> and we just have a brother relationship. We really do. We love to be around each other. We love to work for the Lord uh, together. But, folks, it's different when you mean something ugly. When you say something, I call them those fiery darts, those zingers. Zing! I'm saying this, and I hope it hurts you. Folks, that is not the Christian way. That is not what God tells us to do. That is not what Jesus did. Jesus did not do that. He was humble. Folks, he died on a cross for us. He was accused of being a sinner when he was the perfect son of God. They mistreated Jesus horribly, horribly. But yet, even when Pilate was, was questioning him, he said not a word. So we see the discipline of love. We see the discipline of humility. And the last one I want you to see is the discipline of peace. The difference of peace. Verse 17. And by the way, Jesus had enemies. He had enemies. All right? So don't say he was insulated or isolated, folks. The scribes and the Pharisees hated him. They treated him like dirt. They called him nasty names. So Jesus went through that, and if he can pass, and he did pass the test, he will always pass the test. That supernatural living is the Holy Spirit inside of us saying, and saying, God, take these feet, uh, feelings uh, away. Take these feelings away from me. Let's finish up. Repay no one evil for evil. Again, the world tells you, man, they hurt you, you hurt them. They talked about you, you talk about them. And it says, repay no one evil for evil, for regard of good things in the sight of all men. Find the good in things. Find the good in things. If it is possible, and some people use this word if as if you don't have to do it. Well, folks, if it is possible, my Bible says in Philippians 4.13, what? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. What does that tell me? It's possible. Now, you don't want to do it. <laughs> there are times your flesh just say, oh, I can't stand her. Oh, if she says one more word, I'm going to smack her right in her face. I mean, your flesh, folks, our flesh, we have to deal with our flesh. We have to. All right? 
if it is possible, and I believe it's possible, as much as depends on you, it totally depends on you. It's God in you. It's God in you. Live peaceably with all men. We can do it. We can do it. And again, it's not saying we shouldn't go to war. Folks, we need to defend our country. We need to help those countries that can't. The war in Ukraine, we are right for helping them. That's not what this is talking about. It's saying, folks, live peaceably with everyone you come in contact with. Verse 19, beloved. What's beloved? That's Christians. Do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Now, our thought sometimes is, vengeance is mine, says me. All right? But there's two problems with that. One problem is your attitude. Okay, you don't have the right attitude. If you are wanting to get even, if you have hate in your heart for the person, that there's an attitude problem. There's a spiritual problem in your life. Okay? Vengeance is mine. And the second thing is, God is not going to answer your prayers. If I regard iniquity in my heart, God will not hear me. If you say like John and James did, Man, get him, Lord. Get him, Lord. I'm telling you, he's not going to do anything for you. He's just going to say, when you get your attitude, it's like a kid getting caught. I mean, he just lied, and the kid goes, did you lie? Son? No. Until you get right with God, he's not going to answer your prayers. Jesus says, God says, vengeance is mine. And here's what we think. We think even if, they, if God doesn't do it right now, there's something wrong. But folks, I'm telling you, everyone's going to stand before God. Everyone is. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I would pay. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. It goes back to that hospitality thing. Folks, if somebody's hungry, uh, uh, feed them. It's, it's like our food pantry. And we've spent and spent and spent and spent. Okay? We've had to ask for four, before money. But folks, I can't get away from... Matthew 25, if somebody's hungry, let's feed them. And the biggest part about that is these are children. They can't help what their parents do or do not do. If somebody's hungry, man, buy them a stinking meal, all right? Buy them something. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in doing so, you will heap coals of fire on his head. And you're thinking, all right, coals of fire, here we go. What does it mean? It means that their conscience will bother them when your attitude is right. That's what that means. See, some people want to flip that and, and act like it's, it, you know, you have, you have the last say in it. Folks, I'm telling you, God has the last say, and your attitude is important. For in doing so, you'll heat coals, and, and it says, do not uh, be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Can you imagine if everyone just started doing the right thing? Can you imagine what our world would be like if Christians did the right thing every time? Can you imagine the less heartache, the less breakups, the less animosity, the less hate that would be in our world if we would just follow Jesus' guidelines? Folks, His love is unconditional. His whole being was a picture of humility. And he is the Prince of Peace. I close with this. Matthew 5, verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. What are these? Beatitudes. Attitudes that should be visible in Christians. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, 
for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. You know what the opposite of a beatitude is? It is a bad attitude. And our world is full of bad attitudes. Let me make a statement and I'll close because this is hard to do. You have to be in that supernatural world to do what I'm fixing to ask you to do. True forgiveness. Because I'm telling you, every time I make a statement like this, every time I preach on this, there's always somebody says, but you don't know what they did to me. Folks, I know what they did to Jesus. I know what we did to Jesus. Okay? True forgiveness is agreeing to let go of the consequences of another person's sin. I'm going to say it again. True forgiveness is agreeing to let go of the consequences of another person's sin. Is that not what Jesus did on the cross? God laid all of our sins on him. But yet with nails going and piercing his hands and feet, what did he say? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Folks, I don't care what people have done to you. You would do yourself a great favor to forgive and to let it go and to try to make things right with people who have hurt you. Father, thank you. Thank you for this day. God, thank you that there is a possibility of supernatural living. And God, it's not being super spiritual. It's not something that's phony. It's not something that we cannot do, Lord. God, you showed us that we can do that. And God, I pray first for the Christian. God, I pray, Lord, if there's somebody that has hurt them, if there's somebody that, Lord, they have just uh, really held a grudge against, God, I pray that they would just let it go. They may never apologize for it, but we can change our attitude towards them. We can change our attitudes towards the situation. So God, I pray that Christians today would get in that, <coughs> excuse me, supernatural living in Jesus Christ. God, they would be so much happier. The peace of God would be on their lives. And Lord, I pray if there's one here that doesn't know you, that today would be their day of salvation. They can't do this without you, Lord. They need Jesus. To have godly characteristics, they need to have Jesus. So God, I pray if there's one here that doesn't know you, today would be their day of salvation. Others may need to come for baptism. Others may want to join our church. God, whatever they need to do, God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would just speak to them in a, a mighty way. God, this is your church. This is your invitation. God, thank you for your word. Thank you that it is right, it is yes, and it is amen. So God, we give you this time, the most important time of our service. We give it to you. God, you do with it what you choose. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoken to you in any way, would you come? We thank you for joining us this morning at Rye Hill Baptist Church, and may God richly bless you.